What's going on, Devoted Geeks? Welcome to Com Talk, the podcast extension of Geek Devotions. This is Dallas here. And ladies and gentlemen, this is a special uh, impromptu podcast episode, if you will. Uh, as some of you guys who listened to our most recent episode know, uh, Celeste and I are testing out um, some new equipment from our church. We're starting a new podcast at our church. And we got this uh, Rode uh, Procaster and a Rode Pod mics and stuff like that. So have to test it, make sure everything works right, make sure all the audio is good. And um, today, my pastor and I were up in the studio working on it and making sure some things were running. And so I just hit record. Well, in the midst of us just chit-chatting, uh, we had a pretty good conversation about several things. We talked about uh, some movies, and we talked about uh, music, and we talked about balance. And it was a really great conversation. So I asked him, hey, do you mind if I kind of steal this for our podcast? He's like, yeah, take it. Have fun with it. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, what's going to happen is uh, you're about to experience episode 91 of Calm Talk by Geek Devotions. It's going to be a deviant from our road to Godzilla versus Kong. And it's going to pick up about midway through a conversation that Scott and I are having about uh, movies that we uh, that he's been watching lately. And it's uh, going to be a really interesting conversation. I hope you guys enjoy it. And uh, yeah, let's get into it. Okay, what is happening here? Where are we? Glicks, give us a situation report. Currently, we are on the planet Geekery. Be warned, our impossibility drive may cause distortions okay. as we traverse this land. Impending impossibility engaging in three, oh two, oh one. As layered as uh, Princess Bride, I think it was layered in like nostalgic movies, I right. think was the, like the header for it. Okay, on Netflix? No, I think it was Disney Plus. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it was like nostalgic movies. <laughs> and I was like, well, let me see what they got in there. And so I started going through it because they've got like, you know, they've got like um, uh, classics. Right. Then they have classic remakes. Mm -hmm. So that's where they have like the Mulan that was done with in person people, you know, yeah. and all that. And then they have nostalgic. Mm -hmm. And so for nostalgic, it's like Mary Poppins. Sound of Music, Princess Bride, right? Kind of that that vibe, and then it was Willow, and I was like, Willow, <laughs> I've never even heard of that, right? And it was this guy. The picture that they had on the deal was a guy on a horse with a redheaded girl in front of him, and a midget with a baby. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, That's like the iconic. Scene. Well, that looks that looks like fun. <laughs> <laughs> Let's watch that. That is definitely a wild one right there. So yeah, that was. Uh, that was an interesting. There was some terrible acting in there. Oh yeah, yeah. Most of those nostalgic films are. <laughs> yeah, there was some really horrible acting. There's a movie that I saw years ago. It's kind of that same genre. It's called The Crawl, C R U L L, and nobody remembers this film. I remember it like clear as a bell. Dude had like this. Um, it's like a throwing star business. Like it was a huge mouse, massive, massive thing when blades came off, and he'd throw it, and like he could control it, do all this sort of stuff. His like trying to rescue some princess from like some sort of dome or something like that. So he had like Tron like qualities. Tron like qualities, but in fantasy world world like. So old world. Yeah. Gotcha. And so nobody remembers this movie except for me until now. I, what was it? What's the spelling again? C R U L L. Crawl. Crawl. Yeah. Hmm. And so, but I found I was walking through Brookshire's years ago, and they they were had it in a three dollar bin at Brookshire's. So I was like, I feel validated. I'm not <laughs> lost my mind. This is a real thing. So I bought it. It's a terrible film. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like Xanadu. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, that's horrible. Lizzie loves that. Oh, movie. I know it. <laughs> and then Labyrinth. Oh, yes. Right. Terrible. <laughs> David Bowie. <laughs> terrible. Terrible. But you know what? Most of movies that people would say were nostalgic were not great films. Right. They were more like cult classics. Right. I think the, the the thing is that we've built um, memories around these things. That's what the nostalgic is. It's taking sure. us back to a moment of, of it's something. It's just like music. Yeah. Wherever you were at, <clears throat> whenever you were watching it, mm -hmm. what season were you in life? If you were lonely, if you needed an escape, then mm -hmm. the fantasy movie was probably going to be Your something thing. that was really going to, you know. Yeah, absolutely. If you were... You know, going through a bunch of drama and romance, <laughs> then a dramedy is probably going to be your deal. You know, exactly. Or whatever. One of those things. So, yeah. but uh, but yeah, man, <laughs> Crawl is a terrible film. <laughs> yeah, Willow. Yeah, it had its moments <laughs> when he had the little stick 
and the stuff was coming out of the stick. That was just <laughs> atrocious. I almost spit my coffee out. <laughs> it was <laughs> terrible. <laughs> it was so horrible. The little, um, the little match between the old woman and the the bad queen lady. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was just. <laughs> and then he was trying to figure out how to use the thing, and he was turning the w- old woman into like a crow, and then she yeah. was like a goat. <laughs> And then he was like, I don't know what I'm doing. He just throws <laughs> so it down. And he's, he throws it down. And he runs away, you know, and he comes back and he's uh, trying to do all this stuff. And then she, yeah, she's like a crow. And then she's like, rah, rah, rah. and then she's a goat. And she's like, eh, right. Eh. <laughs> Have you seen the movie before? Val Kilmore's in that. No, for real. Yes. Wow. He's the, he's the, uh, he's the guy that gets with him and takes him to the island. Oh my gosh. You're he's right. in this little cage. They find him in this cage. Right. Because he's a thief, mm-hmm. so he's in the cage like the, um, like um, what's the movie with uh, Ledger and he's a knight? Oh, um, Knight's Tale. Knight's Tale, yeah. Okay, so when they're walking down the the road and the dead bodies are in the thing, and then mm-hmm. there's like a guy in a cage just right. randomly in the middle of a dirt road, and they're right. like, oh yeah, he's a thief, you know? And yeah. They just randomly stuck people in cages, right? You know, hung from a tree or whatever, right? And Kilmer's in that. <laughs> And he sees the two midget guys, right. and then he's like, and then he deceives them all the way until he finally oh, realizes man. who he is. It's and, funny how you don't realize who people are until like later. Like, have you seen Have you seen uh, Age of Ultron or or WandaVision yet? Yes, I've seen WandaVision. So Vision, that guy, yeah, he's in A Knight's Tale, yeah, and people don't recognize him. He's the order, yeah. <laughs> he's the writer. He's the guy that yeah. gambles. Yeah, he's the guy that actually he plays. His character is the name of the actual guy who wrote the Canterbury Tales, which is where the Knight's right. Tales loosely based off of. Yeah. And so that was always an interesting thing. That was a terrible book to read, by the way. I don't know if you read the Canterbury Tales. Maybe. We had to, sure. We had to read it in Old English. Mm. And there's a rhythm to it that just... Jeffrey Chaucer. Brain. Yeah, right? Chaucer. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's like... Uh, it's amazing how culture will will... It takes the right artist to do it because mm-hmm. not everybody's willing to do it. Yeah. But but culturally, it will take you back to things that are actually culturally relevant and things that you should read or you should. That's just like the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Mm-hmm. You know, Dana said she had to read that poem and that poet. Mm-hmm. But it's an Iron Maiden song. Yeah. Nineteen circa nineteen eighty one mm-hmm. or two. They do the whole thing. Oh, I didn't know that. In an epic, I mean, epic. Wow. (laughs) Epic. Wow, Iron Maiden fans, they have no clue. (laughs) That is a classic. (laughs) That's a classic poem of all things, but that the stanzas of the poem, it's not, um, what do they call the real short ones, Japanese? The Uh, haikus. Yeah, it's not that. Mm. It's like a a five-page poem. But the dude doesn't take any of the verses off. Mm. So it's like a 14-minute song. Wow. I no but idea. they make it epic. And then in the middle of the song, when it starts talking about the um, – it starts talking about the – what is hung around the, the neck. Um, it was an old merchant thing. It was an old sailor's thing where they would hang something around your neck um, – if you brought a curse upon the ship or something like that. Wow. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. It was... Uh, like a charm or... No, no, no. It was... Um, I think it's actually a biblical term. Man, we should have been recording this. We you are. You could have used this. <laughs> we are. <laughs> I did it so we could just run the test. <laughs> <laughs> you could use this for a portion of Geek Devotions. <laughs> we'll rock it out. Just on the Willow part. Yeah, right? <laughs> like, hey, you guys remember Willow? <laughs> Yeah, so the rhyme of the ancient mariner was is the longest major poem, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. You probably read him if you went to Magnet High, probably because I think Lizzie and Sierra both did as well. Mm-hmm. And it talks about this sailor who's returned from a voyage. Stops a man on his way to a wedding ceremony, and he begins to narrate a story. And he's narrating the story of how he brought a curse upon 
the boat by his actions. Like he killed like a um, a bird, mm. and for some reason the bird was like um, albatross appears. And leads the ship out of the jam they were stuck in. But even as the albatross is fed and praised by the ship's crew, the mariner shoots the bird. So the albatross. Mm. And then they uh, they are going to kill the guy. It's a it's a whole Jonah mm. or Paul on the ship thing. It's right. like, okay, he's brought this curse the on The reason would throw him out there. <laughs> That's right. And so that basically they put a um, <clears throat> almost like a millstone around him mm-hmm. so that when they throw him out, Wow. He'll go down. That's crazy. And so they do the whole entire song, but it's not your typical it's not your typical it has elements of that typical heavy metal from the eighties, mm-hmm. but it has a it has a symphonic type really? sound. So it's almost like this epic, even though there are no violins or strings in it. Mm-hmm. They make it sound that way with their guitars. Wow. And then, like, they've got, like, gongs that sound like the horn of a ship. He hits a gong, and it sounds like the horn of a ship. And then they stop the song at the kind of the the height of it when they're about to toss him out. And all of a sudden, there's this redemptive moment, and they slow everything down, and all of a sudden, you hear the creaking of the ship. No kidding. Like, it's going through the fog, and it's like... Wow. And, and they, it's really just like, because they're cranking it up to that point, and then all of a sudden it's just like, wow. And if you listen to it visually, you almost go there. Mm-hmm. Like you can see the fog rolling in, mm-hmm. and there's this curse, and there's judgment coming on this ship. Right. And it's like everything's <laughs> creaking, you know, and then the bass player is just like, boom, 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 boom. And the guitarists are making sounds that sound like, a ship creaking, so it's like, wow, and it's just like this. <laughs> and then the actual, then an actual British actor comes in, his voice, mm-hmm. and he says specific things out of the poem. Mm. So he's almost quoting it like a poem now. Wow, and it sounds like a, it sounds like a movie, right? It really sounds like a movie. And then they come out of it, which is, the curse is lifted. Right. You know, and <clears throat> it's really. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I appreciate when artists do that, when they, it's not just a song that was pre-written by some exact because, that you know, they got to get paid, but it's art. <laughs> like, now, I'm not encouraging you to go buy Iron Maiden <laughs> albums, but I will say this. My they also have endorsing Iron Maiden. <laughs> <laughs> I will also say that they, they wrote a song about Alexander <laughs> the Great. Yeah. And basically the whole song is about his conquest and the things that he did and how he brought freedom and all these different things. They literally, Macedonia's in there. Like, Wow. It is, it's a song, but it is like they're reading it out of a history book. Wow. They don't change anything to make it palatable right. for whatever the culture was at that time. That's fascinating. They don't dumb it down. That's a good way of putting it. Hmm. They didn't dumb it down at all. That Alexander the Great song is like, because it's it's fast when he's singing. Right. So Bruce Dickinson almost like gets in a rap almost about Alexander the Great. <laughs> it's really pretty brilliant. I have to look up the track. That sounds yeah. interesting. Yeah. Don't look up Number of the Beast. Okay. <laughs> well, actually, though, that song is not about worshiping the devil. They're just basically quoting scripture. Yeah. I mean, that was the big deal in the 80s is they were, oh, they were Satan worshipers. Yeah, the satanic panic. But basically, they took the text of Revelation and just pulled it out. And they're not saying worship the beast. They're right. s- like they literally quote the scripture. Again, a British voice right. comes in and uh, he quotes Revelation. Wild. And he quotes the whole verse about the number being the number of man, mm-hmm. the number of 666, the number of the beast. That's like good. he quotes the 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 scripture. Right. Hmm. And then when they're saying about it, they're not saying, they're just giving it a historical context. Right. But back then, <laughs> and it was, was like saying. number of the beast, and it's like they're saying, but basically 
man, you could have took that out. Mm-hmm. You could take the verses out of that, and you could preach that as a sermon. Right. Man. Just basically write out of Scripture. That's crazy. Yeah, the 80s was a wild time. Um, the satanic panic and everything going on. I remember um, they were playing a clip from of Rush Limbaugh. And he was talking about how back in the 80s when he was doing his thing, he did a, I guess there it became a, everyone was looking for satanic messages in music. So he, as a gag, took some popular song and had one of his sound technicians play it backwards but put like some evil message in it. And so he hyped it up for like 20 minutes talking about how he's going to play this track and they're going to tell this, say, that how evil this song is because there's an evil message in it. And the radio manager comes in and he goes, hey, how long are you going to run with this? He's like, oh, man, I can get two days out of this. He's like, I need you to stop now. He's like, why? He goes, I have people calling the stations because they're going to their priests and then to their pastors <laughs> freaking out about it. And it was like some wholesome like Partridge Family style song right. being evil. <laughs> yeah. And then there was the whole, there was the whole shift the other way, which is like all things are permissible, right? And I can listen to anything. Mm-hmm. Nobody talking about the doors that it was opening up to people, and there was no balance. Yeah, I mean, there's things that I can hear if I'm at a store or if I'm anywhere and they're playing music over the speakers. Mm-hmm. There are things that I can hear that <clears throat> it's not worship to the Lord, and it's not worship music, and it's secular music and all that, but it doesn't make me feel right. Like there's a there's a a spirit attached to it, right? But now there's other things I can listen to, and it doesn't even have to be hard rock or anything else. Right. It can be, man, it can be pop, it can be country, right? But man, the moment I hear it, I'm like, mm, I right. can't listen to that, man. And that's the thing is like, it's a matter of people, what people are sensitive to to a degree, but like, there's a balance to like what we should and shouldn't do. I remember Tristan was showing me an anime, and uh, I was listening to, it, I was like. Bro, this is not good. Now, I'm I'm into anime. I know certain things, and yep. he's like, "What are you talking about?" I was like, "I'm telling you, Tristan. There's with you specifically. There's a bad spirit about this. It's not good yep. for you." But people are like, "But it's all open. It's all free." I'm like, "There's balance." <laughs> yeah, and that's where discernment comes in. Right. You know, if you don't have that discernment, mm-hmm. now again, people will use that as an excuse. That, oh, this doesn't bother me. Mm-hmm. Well, that doesn't mean that it's not bad for right. you. <laughs> exactly. That, that means that maybe you just. Or like I like this, and right. I don't want to listen to the Lord. Yeah, but I think there's like this. I think the Lord can speak to us in a lot of different things that maybe we don't allow Him to, mm-hmm. because it's whatever mm-hmm. secular nature, whatever. But there's no. I mean, the Bible says over and over and over again that our motives. It's not just about what we're doing, but why we're doing it. Mm-hmm. And motives matter. Yeah. The motive behind something matters. And then that is really what influences the spirit of whatever you're creating. Mm-hmm. And so if your motive is deception, if your motive is anti-God, mm-hmm. then that is going to come out in your art or whatever you do. Yeah. And a believer should be able to pick up on that. Absolutely. And go, hmm, there's something... I mean, again, there's things I can listen to, and people are like, oh, you listen to that? And I'm like, yeah, I listen to it every once in a while. You know, there's nothing, there's really nothing attached to it. Right. I mean, it's not like I don't know about music. Right, because <laughs> you do. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, you know, I I do my due diligence and all of that stuff, but, man, there's some stuff. Again, it it may not even have a bad word or anything in it, mm-hmm. but, man, the moment I hear it, I'm like, mm, this was not created in a good environment. Yeah. This was... This is not like you can listen to some of the old Beatles stuff, mm-hmm. and you can just be like, "Whoa!" You know they were deep into man, some stuff, they're... and we're not just talking about the drug aspect. Yeah, of it. when they went into the stuff. when they went into the Eastern mysticism mm-hmm. portion of the late '60s, mm-hmm. some of that stuff has a um, even like um, Zeppelin, you know, things of that nature. Um, but then there's bands that you can almost tell the season they were in because mm-hmm. there's some things they produce and you're like, mm, man, I can't listen to that. Mm-hmm. And then there's a whole other season where you're like, well, wait a second, is that the same band? Right. It's like there was this whole different vibe going on mm-hmm. um, to what they were doing. Right. That's like Paul Rogers uh, from Bad Company, the guy that I kind of put up here. That's the singer okay. that I want to be. <clears throat> And many say the greatest rock and roll singer of all time. Some say one of the greatest top ten singers of all time in any genre. Oh, wow. And 
he was straight edge before people even knew what straight edge was. Hmm. No drinking, no drugs, no womanizing. Dude had the same wife for <laughs> forever. That's lit. <clears throat> you know, and so, and he was right in the middle of late 60s in London. Mm-hmm. That scene was Zeppelin, the Stones, Beatles coming out of all that into the early 70s, which was just, I mean, you're talking middle of Woodstock, Haight Ashbury, all that stuff. And here's mm-hmm. a guy that clean, straight across the board. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that's that was really, that's still in common to the degree right now. Right. So that's awesome. Yeah. Man. I remember I was listening to an uh, interview with uh, Brian Welsh. Uh, head bass player for Corn, and uh, he was talking about how, where because people were criticizing him for going back to play for Corn, and he was talking about when I'm there, he goes, I'm not drinking. He goes, I like the guys all know my stance; they're very clear, and I'm I'm about as straight edge I can be in this environment. And I think people feel like, a because of the the stigma of it, they feel like you can't do that. They feel like yeah. you can't be in a secular <laughs> workplace and and not be worldly. I'm like, do, do what about the guy that works over at McDonald's? <laughs> You know? Now, the one thing that he did do is there are some songs he won't do. Exactly. And he, one of them him. is one of them is the one that woke him up, mm-hmm. which was he was walking through his living room or something, mm-hmm. and his daughter was like two or three, and she was singing the words to the song, and the song was about like taking advantage of a woman, demeaning oh, wow. a woman, calling her all these names, like loaning her out as a prostitute, like whatever that song is mm-hmm. they did. And he's walking through the living room and she's singing it. Yeah. And he was just like, whoa. Yeah. That's that's honestly the thing that I, it's, I see this dichotomy right now where people are, are like, they're almost like glorify kids doing that kind of stuff, singing those songs, saying those words. There's a guy that um I found and um, he has a, series of merch it's called um, Get Effed Karen, but it's not censored. And his kids wear his merch. And it's, it just says GFK on it, and he lets his kids say these words and everything. I'm like, your kid's 10, dude. Yeah. And they're like, oh, this is so funny. This is awesome. <clears throat> and I'm like, what? But then you have the other people who, oh, there's a comedian, and he said that um, he realized when he'd gone too far, when he got a phone call from his teacher, from his kid's teacher that his son was singing a song that was inappropriate. He's like, what is he singing? And it, it was about male anatomy. It was, a, it was a comedy sketch that he did. And she goes, do you know the song? He's like, I wrote the song. And he yeah. realized, I really got to be careful about what I give my kids to listen to. <laughs> yep. And the influence I have on them. Yeah. So, wild. No balance. <laughs> no balance. Zero. Pops returning to normal stasis in three, two, one. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed that conversation between Scott and I. Um, hey, if you're interested in knowing more about The Healing Place, which is my church where I'm one of, one of the pastors there, and obviously Scott's our lead pastor, I want to encourage you guys to check out our website, thpshreveport.com. And if you want to know more about Scott, just look up Scott Etheridge on uh, Facebook. There's a couple of them. He's the one with the big beard. <laughs> uh, or check out his Instagram, uh, Ezekiel478. That's how you can find him on Instagram. Let him know that uh, you, you found him through ComTalk. That'd be kind of cool for me. Uh, that being said, I want to encourage you guys to check out the rest of Geek Devotions. We have a website, geekdevotions.com. You can find us on all of your social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, just look for Geek Devotions. I also want to encourage you guys, please do us a favor and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. This helps people to find this podcast, helps people to find the ministry, and helps people to, uh, you know, be encouraged. <laughs> so all that being said, guys, thank you again so much for being part of our uh, community here at Geek Devotions. Celeste and I love every one of you. We appreciate you guys. All the encouragement you guys have given us. Um, and uh, I don't know how else to say it, but we love you guys. So until next time, remember stay devoted, peace, and love. <laughs>